so thank you very much for the invitation and for being here. Uh, so yeah, apologies for giving a, a Blackboard talk, uh, but uh, yeah, I hope it's uh, it's fine. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the isogeny interpolation problem, which is a problem that we isolated from uh, 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 work by, by me and Thomas de Cru. And then there was a follow-up work by uh, Luciano Maino, Chloe Martindale, Lorenz Pani, uh, Giacomo Pope, and Benjamin Veselowski. And then everything was kind of summarized by Damiano Baer. And this is uh, the starting point for uh, this talk. So this is a paper from last year, um, solving an, a rather general instance of the isogeny interpolation problem. And in this talk, we will review, review his work and, uh, and then uh, give a, a more general solution to the isogeny interpolation problem. And so let me start with the following lemma, which is the, yeah, the motivating lemma. So, so every degree the isogeny between two elliptic curves, E1 and E2, is uniquely determined, or let me maybe for consistency with later notation, right, E and E prime, is uniquely determined uh, by the images uh, the images of any 4D plus one points. And that's an easy lemma to prove. So let me just quickly sketch the proof. Uh, so imagine you have uh, two uh, isogenies of degree D, uh, which agree on uh, 4D plus one points. Um, uh, so the claim is to, that they are automatically the same. So imagine uh, you have two such isogenies that are not the same. Um, so then we can consider the difference isogeny. And we can say something about the degree of that difference isogeny. Uh, namely, the degree is always bigger than the number of uh, elements in the kernel. But since both isogenies are assumed to, uh, to agree on uh, 4d plus 1 points, this number of points in the kernel uh, is at least 4d plus 1. But then there's this uh, cauchy schwartz type inequality for the degree uh, of isogenies, so the degree uh, satisfies uh, this inequality, which you may know from uh, one of the proofs of uh, the Hasse-Weil bound to apply to Frobenius uh, minus the identity uh, and one. Um, so this is the uh, inequality in general. And this will imply that the degree of phi one minus phi two is at most uh, for the, and so that's a contradiction. Uh, and so this proves this lemma, okay? So whenever you have an isogeny, you know the degree D and you know uh, how it acts. So you know the images of 4D plus one points, uh, then this gives you, uh, uh, then, then you know that the isogeny is uniquely determined. Uh, so a quick remark maybe, uh, this, uh, this bound is sharp. Uh, and the reason is that uh, whenever you have an isogeny phi, uh, and you, then you can also consider minus phi. Uh, and so phi and minus phi, they agree on, uh, uh, sorry, on half, on the, the points that uh, double to a point in the kernel of phi. So by this, I mean the set of points whose double is in the kernel of phi. On such points, phi and minus phi uh, take the same values. Uh, and the number of points here is uh, 4D typically. Uh, so phi and minus phi will typically agree on 4D points. Okay, in any case, this lemma leads, uh, naturally leads to, to what we call the isogeny interpolation problem. So let me abbreviate it IIP. Um, so let's state it as follows. We have the input to the problem, which are the elliptic curves E, E prime, so the domain and the codomain. And as I said, we assume here that we know the degree. Often you can derive the degree uh, from, from the other uh, data, but not always. And then we also assume that we have points P1 up to PK uh, that generate a group, uh, a group G. So this is a group, subgroup of E, uh, such that the number of elements in this group uh, is uh, 
bigger than 4D. Because if you know how an isogeny acts on a, on a bunch of points, then of course you know how it acts on the group generated by those points because isogenies are group homomorphisms. So we can always talk about the group generated by these points. And then we have uh, candidate image points. Uh, and we also have a challenge point uh, S. And then the output should be, well, either it should be phi of S if there exists an isogeny phi of degree D uh, such that phi of pi equals pi prime for all uh, indices i, or uh, like perp, the perp symbol if, uh, if no such phi exists. Okay, so thanks to this lemma, this is a well-defined problem. Uh, and so this is the problem that we are going to study uh, in this talk. Um, so is the statement clear to anyone? Uh, so the disadvantage of this uh, whiteboard app is that I have to erase everything whenever I switch to a new uh, board, but I hope uh, the statement is clear. So we have uh, two elliptic curves, E, E prime. We have a bunch of points, a bunch of candidate image points. And then the hope is to evaluate the unique isogeny interpolating uh, these uh, values at any uh, given challenge point. S. Okay, um, so that's... Um, That's that. And so let's um, give some context for this. So context, um, uh, a special case. Uh, was solved in the context of uh, breaking SIDH. So SIDH stands for super singular isogeny Diffie-Hellman. And this is or, or was a key exchange uh, uh, protocol um, that was proposed uh, by Zhao and Defeo in 2011. Zhao, sorry, and Defeo in 2011. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the, yeah the, the hope was that this would be uh, secure against attacks by quantum computers and it was submitted to a competition that is uh, still ongoing by NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, an American government organization. Uh, and there, yeah, it reached uh, the fourth round, which is like a parallel final round uh, before it was uh, broken. Um, and so the, the version we are going to present or, or start from today, as I mentioned, is uh, due to Robert. So the special case that I'm referring here uh, to here is uh, due to Robert. Um, and so uh, he yeah, found an efficient solution essentially when because there are some subtleties here with this conclusion. Uh, the group G is the N torsion subgroup for some uh, integer n, um, co-prime to the field characteristic, uh, characteristic, um, and it should be smooth. And of course, there's this bound that we already mentioned, the number of elements in that group, which is n squared in this case, should be bigger than 4d. Uh, so in this case, uh, this is uh, this was solved in this uh, work by Robert, uh, and so uh, we uh, continued. So yeah, this attack, uh, as I mentioned, we uh, um, uh, partially co-discovered it with a bunch of people, and now we are teaming up uh, to, to to tackle the isogeny interpolation problem uh, in greater generality. Um, and if time permits, I can also mention something about the applications of this, uh, but my, I will concentrate on the, on the, on the problem itself mainly. Um, so before stating uh, our main theorem, uh, let me make some assumptions. 
uh, which will simplify uh, this talk. So I will assume that uh, all curves E, E prime, uh, but also all these interpolation points Uh, and also the challenge point S uh, are defined over a fixed finite field. So also this work by Robert is of finite fields, uh, by the way. Uh, so I fix a finite field FQ, let's say P to the R. Um, and I assume that all my input data is defined over that field already. Um, so it's useful to, to not assume this. I will mention something about that uh, in a second, uh, but here we will assume it. Uh, and then it's also uh, easy to uh, conclude that you can also assume that the isogeny itself, if it exists, uh, is defined over FQ. So that's not really, that's not always uh, automatic, but uh, you can go to a, a degree two or at worst degree six extension for this to, to be true. So you can also assume that phi is defined over FQ. Okay, now, uh, if we assume this, then we can actually immediately reduce to the case uh, K uh, is at most two. Why is this? Uh, well, any finite subgroup um, of an elliptic curve uh, is of the form Z mod A times Z mod B uh, for some, um, yeah. No, I will. I will uh, rewrite it as a times. B. So I wanted to say for some uh, a that it is a divider of b, but I will immediately write it as a times b. Okay. So I write my group as z mod a times z mod a b. Uh, so for some a b and uh, p uh, is not a divider of a. Yeah. So what I have to say here. Okay. So. Um, by reorganizing this so that you uh, are giving the uh, image points on generators of this group, you can reduce to uh, the case case uh, k at most uh, two. Okay. So uh, one might wonder why do we state this isogeny interpolation problem for general k for k that are bigger than two? So why allowing uh, for k bigger than two in the statement of the isogeny interpolation problem. Uh, and so the reason is that, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's, uh, it also includes uh, situations that occur really in practice. So this is to include uh, situations where uh, the PIs are actually not defined over FQ necessarily, but defined over small extensions of FQ. Uh, with a huge compositum. Uh, so it could see it could be that P1 is a point of order uh, L1, P2 is a point of order L2, P3 is a point of order L3, and so on. PK is a point of order LK. Uh, and so uh, where the LIs are small primes, and then um, yeah, these points uh, live over small extensions uh, of uh, FQ. Uh, but the field compositum is of the degree the product of those primes and can be huge. And so uh, this is still like, say, small input to the problem. Um, but if you want to represent it like this, uh, then the field would have to be huge. And so the input size would then uh, explode. Uh, and so it's really useful to, to cover such cases. But uh, I won't say too much about uh, this uh, uh, in this talk. So let me uh, maybe immediately state then the theorem that we uh, proved. Um, so theorem. So um, there exists. Uh, an, an, a deterministic algorithm uh, 
for yeah for the isogeny interpolation problem uh which works as soon as uh, p does not divide b so uh remember our group was of the form z mod a times z mod a b and uh, p did not divide a anyway so this condition is just equivalent to saying that p should not divide the order of the group um and which requires a number of uh, operations a number of bit of operations that is uh, polynomial in uh, so the size the bit size of the field and then uh, yeah, that's to be expected of course uh, and then the degree of uh, the defining field of uh, the A, B1, B2 torsion. So let me mention something about that. Um, so B1 and B2 are as follows. So we will write B as a, a complete square times a, like a, a square free part. So b2 square free okay so we'll factor out all the squares of b and we'll put them in b1 and so um, yeah in case uh, you would put b1 squared here then you would just have uh, uh, yeah let's say the exponent of this group uh, so the the smallest field of the uh, the, the defining field of uh, the points where all uh, the torsion lives uh, of this size, but we can do a little bit better. Okay, so this is a, a small improvement. Um, and then also, and this is uh, to be fundamental to the method, uh, the largest prime factor. Of uh, the number of elements in G. Uh, so in other words, the largest prime factor of, uh, let's say, A, uh, B, if you want. Okay, so that's uh, the theorem in this uh, simplified setting. But nevertheless, let me just remark that uh, what we do, what we can prove in the in the in the general setting. So in general, you can replace. Uh, uh, two with the following. Uh, so let's call it two prime, maybe. Um, namely, uh, instead of looking at the degree of the defining field. So, so by the degree of the defining field, I mean uh, the smallest field extension where all the A, B1, B2 torsion points uh, live, right? Um, so here we can take the largest degree uh, uh, the largest among the degrees of the defining fields of, well, the points, the interpolation points, because now they are no longer assumed to be defined over the base field. So that's uh, natural. And now, uh, so this here becomes replaced uh, with uh, the L to the power P over two torsion. Let's make it, turn it into an integer uh, over all prime powers. Uh, L to the E uh, dividing uh, the order of the P. Okay. So that's uh, that's what we can do in general. So if you don't uh, assume that everything is already defined over the base field, then you can by working piecewise uh, over all prime powers, dividing the order of the group, you can uh, you can stay in a rather small field extensions as long as this is smooth, right? Because also here in this theorem, uh, the algorithm 
has a running time that is polynomial in the largest prime factor of uh, the number of elements of G. So in order for this to be an efficient algorithm, uh, the number of elements in this group has to be, uh, or, uh, yeah, the number of elements in this group has to be smooth, has to be, has to split to small prime factors. Uh, and that's really, as I said, fundamental to the method. Uh, so let's make a quick sub-remark here. Um, for super singular elliptic curves, and this is uh, the most relevant case uh, in cryptography. So rem remember that SIDH stood for super singular isogeny diffie Hellman. So for super singular elliptic curves, uh, the conditions or the condition, let's say, P, not the divisor of V, that's uh, uh, void. So there's no, this is automatic in that case. And also the dependency here um, on the on this field of definitions, uh, or the same here, uh, is, uh, is also void. So And that's because, uh, yeah, the torsion, the full, as, as soon as you have a point of a given order, um, then the full uh, torsion of that order will be defined uh, over the same field or over a very small extension of that field. So uh, depending on the model you use. And so in, especially in the super singular case, uh, I think this theorem is as strong as, as it can be with the methods that we have. Namely, you get a polynomial time algorithm in the field size and in the largest prime factor of the of the group you're interpolating. Uh, so this dependency on two uh, disappears, uh, same here. Okay, uh, but here's an example of a case we cannot solve. Uh, and so maybe also some publicity uh, in case people want to think about this. Uh, so th this is an example of a case uh, we cannot solve. So imagine that E and E prime are ordinary and say over uh, of the field of characteristic two, or well, any small characteristic will do here, say. Uh, and suppose that we know how the isogeny acts uh, on a sufficiently large uh, um, subgroup of order of power of two. So in this case, this is a cyclic group. Um, so that's a case where we cannot do anything. Okay. So if the size of this group is bigger than four times D, then it's still true that the isogeny uh, between E and E prime is uniquely determined. Um, however, uh, our algorithm cannot uh, tackle this. Uh, so we thought a little bit about using lifting arguments to characteristic zero, but then you get in trouble with this uh, with the field of definitions of this full torsion. So this is, uh, yeah, uh, some uh, problem that I would like to publicize if people want to uh, have ideas on how to tackle that. Um, okay, so I hope the problem statement and our theorem uh, statement are uh, clear. So now let's, um, Let's discuss uh, the solution, uh, and let's first start with the solution by Damiano Baer uh, in this um, in this particular uh, case that I mentioned and that I will repeat uh, now. So um, let's say this is uh, yeah, section two. I don't know if I wrote down section one for the introduction, but this is section two. And in section two, we will study the case where the group is the full n torsion. Uh, with, uh, oh, I forgot to mention, I, I think I didn't mention it uh, exactly. So Robert did the full n torsion, where n is co-prime to the characteristic. Uh, but also uh, a big assumption was that the torsion level and the degree of the secret isogeny are co-prime. I forgot to mention that. So, so this will follow. Uh, Robert's paper. Um, so, okay, so let's say, uh, let's recap. So we have our isogeny phi from E to E prime. It has degree D. 
And we know how the isogeny acts on the n-torsion. So let's take uh, a basis of the n-torsion. So we also know um, the images. It's both p1 prime as before and p2 prime. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we would like to evaluate this phi in any given uh, so goal. Compute uh, phi of s for any given s. Okay. So let's do a very special case, but which already contains uh, all the ingredient. Uh, so let's say special case. So the special case that I want to discuss is where uh, n, so distortion level, minus the degree is a perfect square. So later on, this condition will be relaxed to being a sum of two squares or a sum of four squares. And because every positive integer or every integer is a sum of every positive integer is a sum of four squares, uh, this will no longer be a, a condition, except that this still has to be positive. And remember, actually, uh, the assumption should be that the number of elements in this group is um, bigger than uh, four times uh, the degree of the isogeny. Uh, so the assumption is that n squared, which is the number of elements in this group, uh, is bigger than uh, four times. And so even uh, so so yeah, even assuming that this is positive is not not immediately uh, uh, not always true. Okay, under this assumption, so this just says that n should be bigger than two times square root of d. But we'll get back to that. Okay, so the special case is where n is bigger than d and n minus d is a square. Uh, so then how do we solve this? Well, we consider the following uh, isogeny between uh, principally polarized abelian surfaces. Um, and uh, the abelian surfaces are just uh, E cross E prime equipped with the product uh, polarization to itself. So it will be an endomorphism. And uh, we write this uh, endomorphism in matrix form. So this is multiplication by M, so the same M as here. Here we uh, do phi hat minus phi uh, M. So how should you read this? Um, so let's say you have a point uh, PQ here. Then uh, this is sent to M times P plus phi hat of Q. And this will land, uh, this will be the first component here. And then the second component will be minus phi of P uh, plus M times Q. Okay, so it's really matrix. Uh, you put PQ as a mate, as a vector. As, a, as kind of a vector uh, after this matrix and uh, do the matrix multiplication. So I hope this notation is clear. Um, so that's uh, yeah, that's the isogeny uh, that we will use. Uh, and note, uh, this is an isogeny of uh, yeah, this uh, an n isogeny, say, in the sense that it splits. So let's do this. Yeah, this is an I. Uh, or let's just write explicitly what I want to say with this. So the dual uh, composes to multiplication by n. Okay, so uh, the dual with respect to, to the product polarization amounts to. Uh, taking the conjugate transpose, where conjugation should be read as taking the dual uh, component wise. Uh, so uh, the computation, the relevant computation is then the following. And now you take uh, the conjugate transpose. And if you uh, work out what you get, uh, you find m squared plus the degree. Here you find m times minus phi hat plus phi hat times m. So you get zero. Here also you get zero. And here you get a uh, degree again. Uh, m squared plus a degree again. But remember that m squared plus the degree is just n. 
Okay, so this is indeed uh, multiplication by n. Uh, so that's one thing to observe. And a second thing to observe is that, um, uh, yeah, or, well, it's, it's on, the, on the same line. So let's, uh, let's state it immediately as an equality. So the kernel of phi is um, the set of points of the form MP uh, phi P, where P runs through the uh, n torsion of P. And now that we can write down uh, generators for this group, thanks to the fact that we know the images of P1 and P2. This is just a group generated by P1, so the M times P1, and P1 prime. And this will be the big, uh, yeah, the big ingredient to the algorithm, the fact that we can write down the kernel of this phi, thanks to the given interpolation data. Um, so this is this group. Um, so let's give a proof of this. So we just evaluate this uh, capital phi in such a point. And so this gives you uh, m squared times p plus d times p. And then this gives you 0 here, minus phi m, minus phi m, m phi, so this is 0 here. But this top thing is also zero, right? Because m squared plus d is n, and our point is a point of order n. So this is also a zero. And so it follows that uh, the kernel is a subgroup. Sorry, that this this uh, this thing here. Uh, so the right hand side say is a subgroup of the kernel. But then it's easy to check that this is an n, n subgroup. So as a subgroup, this is isomorphic to z mod n uh, times z mod n. Um, and so it has to be the full kernel. So it has the right number of elements. Uh, OK, so now what is the um, conclusion? The conclusion is that we can write down uh, the kernel of this big map explicitly. Okay, so that's right here. So um, we can explicitly write down the kernel of this big map. But this almost means that you can just immediately write down phi, at least if uh, n is smooth. So if n is smooth, uh, we can compute uh, an isogeny with that kernel. But yeah, the kernel uniquely determines the isogeny up to post-composition with an isomorphism. So we can compute uh, phi uh, up to uh, post composition with with an automorphism, but typically you only have uh, things like one times minus one or something, uh, and that's uh, easy to deal with. Okay, so what will happen in practice if you do this? You will split uh, n as a product of the prime factors. And you assume that all these li are small. And then uh, you can really compute an isogeny with that kernel. So you start from e cross e prime. So let me really draw it like as an, uh, an x axis times a, a y axis. So here you have your two points. So the point p1, or m times p1, sorry, p1 prime. And you have the point m times p2, p2 prime. And now you, uh, yeah, you quotient out the subgroup uh, generated by these two points, and you do it in steps. So you first uh, multiply the subgroup with n divided by L1. So this gives you an L1 isogeny, or L1, L1 isogeny, to be more precise. <clears throat> this will not take you to 
e cross e prime, it will take you uh, to some Jacobian. Uh, so how should I draw this? Something like this. <laughs> so typically, well, it could be a product exceptionally, but it, 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 in general, it's a Jacobian of a genus two curve. And then you repeat this and so on. And in the last step, you do an uh, LR, LR isogeny. Uh, and now it takes you back to this product of elliptic curves. Um, so these small isogenies, they can be computed. Um, so for instance, if L1 or L, uh, if L1 is two, then these are form there are explicit formula due to Richelieu for taking these steps, except for the, the first step and the last step, like which is a gluing step and a splitting step. You have to resort to other formulas, but uh, they exist, they have been worked out. Uh, but in general, you can uh, resort to a method, uh, say by Lubic and uh, Robert, um, for doing this uh, for arbitrary L. As long as L is small, this is sufficient. Okay, so um, we are almost there. Uh, from the interpolation data, we can write down this uh, capital phi here, this big isogeny between uh, uh, this product of elliptic curves and the same product of elliptic curves. We can write down the kernel thanks to the given interpolation data. From the kernel, we can compute this chain of isogenies, and we can now evaluate uh, this big isogeny in any point. And so now, uh, so apologies for the messy uh, board. Now, the remember the goal is to compute uh, phi of s. So what we are going to do is we are going to compute minus uh, phi of uh, S zero. So if you compute minus phi of S zero, then you will see if you put S zero here, uh, so this gives you M times S, gives you minus M times S, uh, and it gives you phi of S. Okay, and so uh, you recover the desired phi of S uh, as the second component. Okay, so from the interpolation data, you build the kernel of a higher dimensional isogeny. Uh, you compute the isogeny, you compute the image of S0 under that big isogeny, up to sign, uh, and you recover the desired image. So that's that's the method, um, which uh, remember is in a very special case, but uh, it, uh, it generalize, generalizes nicely. So I would like to now explain um, first on how to get rid of the assumption that, that n should be bigger than d okay so we assume that n is bigger than d so end up with a positive number and then we moreover hoped that that number was a square uh, but as i said this condition that the number is a square can be relaxed to being a sum of four squares so in fact only the positivity of this uh, left hand side becomes a crucial assumption I will also mention a, a bit more about that later. But let's first uh, try to relax this assumption that n minus d is positive to, uh, to n minus square root of d be positive, essentially. So I'll do that now. Um, so let's say that's special case one. So special case two. And this is where. Um, and uh, squared minus d is a square. Okay, so this is, um, now we are assuming that n minus square root of d is positive and we are still assuming that this is a square. Uh, so how do we proceed here? Well, we proceed as before. So we again built uh, this isogeny. Let's again call it capital phi. same uh, matrix. Um, however, we no longer know the uh, kernel of phi because the kernel of phi would now be uh, everything of the form mp phi p but p 
running over the n square torsion, right? Just copying the reasoning from before, but applying it to n squared. This is the kernel of phi, but we no longer know this kernel of phi because we don't know how phi acts on the n square torsion. We only know how it acts on the n torsion. So the group, the interpolation group remains the n here. So we don't know it, but we do know n times the kernel of phi. Because n times the kernel of phi is just the same, but where you restrict to the n torsion. So that's really, again, the same subgroup as before. Uh, so what does this mean? Well, we can't really quotient out the kernel of phi immediately because we don't, yeah, we don't know it. But we can quotient out n times the kernel of phi, which basically means that we can do the first half of this walk. Okay, so what it means is that um, this big phi, you can decompose it into uh, an isogeny phi one, and this has kernel uh, n times the kernel of capital phi. Uh, and then there's a phi two that we don't know yet. Again, taking us to the product here. Okay, now in the interest of time, I won't uh, explain it in detail, but uh, uh, the main ingredient here um, is not so hard to explain. Uh, what are we going to do? Well, we are going to, uh, re to uh, realize this or to compute this phi two by walking from right to left. In other words, by computing the dual of phi. And remember the dual of phi in shape had a very similar uh, format. Uh, so remember. So the dual of phi, so let me abuse notation a bit and identify it with this matrix. So the dual of phi was this. And so, uh, so n times, so by exactly the same reasoning, but just applying it to minus phi, n times the kernel of uh, the dual of phi uh, is um, m times p1 uh, minus p1, m times p2 minus p2. Okay, so we know the kernel, uh, we know the first half of the dual isogeny. But the dual isogeny, the first half of that is exactly the phi two, or at least the dual of it that we are looking for. Okay, so this is the kernel of uh, phi two uh, dual. Yeah, and so thanks to this, we can essentially compute phi two dual. There's a bit of a subtlety here uh, because you have to glue uh, this phi one and phi two dual in the middle in, in the correct way. So this will again, in general, be the Jacobian of a genus two curve. might exceptionally be a product. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we can, uh, yeah, starting from here, we can compute the dual of phi two. We can then take the dual of that again and essentially have phi two and recover capital phi as the composition of, uh, yeah, let's say phi two dual dual uh, with phi. And then we proceed as before. Okay, so I hope that idea is clear. Um, so what we have done now is, uh, so recap, this solves the case. Where n is bigger than, so let me write two. So the two here is needed uh, and that's for this automorphism to fix for this automorphism at the end. So I ignore this. Uh, but in any case, so this solves cases where n is essentially bigger than the square root of d, and uh, n squared minus uh, d is a square. And now uh, this can be uh, generalized. So uh, method generalizes to. to n square minus d being a sum of squares. And let me mention 
So yeah, you can always work with R equals four, uh, but the method generalizes also to a sum of two squares. And if it's a sum of two squares, it's actually much better to, to work with uh, R equals two. Um, but for the theorem, it doesn't matter. Um, so where pi gets replaced uh, and people working on uh, abelian uh, varieties will de definitely recognize this uh, with um, yeah the following map. So you go from E to the R plus E prime to the R. So potentially you go up to dimension eight in general. E R cross E prime to R. And the matrix uh, is now an eight by eight matrix. And it takes this form. So here you take the pi hat uh, on the diagonal, minus pi on the diagonal. And the main ingredient is uh, is the matrix A, which is such that A times A transpose equals A transpose times A equals uh, N squared minus B, so the sum of these squares and the identity. And such a matrix exists for R equals, uh, if R equals uh, one, two, or four. If R equals four, um, you can realize A as a matrix of multiplication, as a matrix of multiplication with a, with a quaternion uh, A1 plus A2i plus A3j plus A4k uh, in in the quaternion algebra, uh, in the standard quaternion algebra, say. So this uh, is reminiscent of uh, of a trick known as uh, Zarhin's trick. Um, yeah, so this is uh, yeah, a seemingly big step to go from n squared minus d being a square to n squared minus d being a sum of squares. But that's, uh, I guess, the big observation that Damien Robert had, uh, that this is actually, uh, that the generalization is uh, relatively straightforward. Um, OK, so this is um, Damien Robert's um, version of the uh, interpolation attack. So now let's um, yeah, give some uh, hints at how to solve the general case. Um, so let's say uh, general case. At what time should I stop? Uh, well, yeah, we started a bit later, maybe a few, a few more minutes. Yeah, yeah I'll uh, try to give uh, the main hints. Uh, so the general case. So this is actually the work uh, that we did for this uh, paper in progress. Uh, so the general case, uh, consists of two steps, two phases, two ingredients. Um, so let's say two ingredients. So the first one is a generalization of the previous method. to uh, the case where G is still a full N torsion group, really call it uh, one or something. Um, so it's still a full N torsion group, but we drop the assumption, uh, but where possibly uh, the GCD of n and the degree of the isogeny is positive, or uh, sorry, is bigger than one. So that's uh, a seeming 
really a uh, mild tweak. And indeed, it's uh, yeah, in retrospect, it is uh, a mild modification of the method. I'll try to say something about it, uh, but it's it's really crucial uh, because that's what uh, what will come out of the second uh, case. So in the second case, we will reduce. Uh, so the general case, say, to case one. Uh, so there are tricks to, um, if you're facing an interpolation problem, um, there are tricks to reduce it to uh, an interpolation problem where the given, where the, in, you know, the group uh, that you want to interpolate, say, uh, is a full n torsion group, but it's out of this, uh, so the result of this reduction will almost never satisfy that the GCG is one. Okay, so this is really uh, crucial. And so let me give a hint um, of uh, uh, two, maybe, uh, in the interest of time. Um, so, uh, so yeah, solution to two. So it will contain yeah all the ingredients, but it's a, a bit more technical than I will explain now. Um, so let's say for simplicity that the group is cyclic. G is generated by uh, one point E1. So K equals one. So that's definitely not of this form. Uh, so the order of P1 is n and n is bigger than uh, 4d okay and we also know uh, we are given its image Let's call it p1 time okay so we are facing an interpolation problem for one point of order n uh, where n satisfy the bound of the lemma that we started with. So the isogeny uh, is uniquely determined, uh, but this group is definitely not of this form. And so we cannot uh, apply the method from before. And so the type of reduction uh, works as follows. So we have our phi here. Uh, uh, it goes from E to E prime. Let's maybe write it like this. Uh, we have our point P1 here. And we know that P1 is mapped to P1 prime. So what we do is we um, extend P1 to a basis P1, P2 of the n torsion. So we pick a P2 such that uh, the n torsion is P1, P2, generated by P1 and P2. And we do the same here. So we just pick any. Uh, E2 prime such that the n torsion on uh, E prime is generated by P1 prime. And let's also assume for simplicity uh, that uh, the GCD between n and d is 1. Okay, So this is an isogeny of degree d and n is co friendly, but we only are given how the isogeny acts on one point. So we extend, as I said, P1 to a basis P1, P2 of the n torsion of E. We extend P1 prime to a, a basis P1 prime, P2 prime of the n torsion of E prime. Of course, we do not know that whether or not P2 is mapped to P2 prime or not. In general, uh, we, we would have to be very lucky for this to, uh, to happen. But what we do know is that phi of uh, P2 is a multiple, uh, yeah, is, is mapped to something of the form lambda times P2 prime plus mu times P1 prime, okay? So uh, this is a, an n torsion point, so it has to be expressible in terms of this basis. Uh, and by this assumption here, that GCD of N and D is one, in general, if one can get rid of it, uh, this lambda is a unit. And now by comparing uh, Uh, the well pairing to the well pairing here, the other end. Uh, we can reduce to the case where lambda is one. 
So in other words, we can compute lambda from the weld pairing. Yeah, and that uses this uh, rule that uh, the weld pairing uh, is compatible with, uh, with isogenies in this sense. Okay, so what you do is you uh, plug in pi of p2 here, you have p1 prime here, and you will get lambda uh, out as an exponent. So you can compute lambda, and by failing, failing with lambda, we can assume that p2 prime, um, but the coefficient that p2 prime is, uh, is 1. Okay, so I hope that's clear. So, okay, so uh, we know that phi of p2 equals p2 prime. But we can't get rid, so this well pairing doesn't allow for this to get rid of this, uh, this second component. So we still don't know the image of P2. However, what we do now is we quotient out the subgroup generated by P1 prime. Okay. So it seems like a strange thing to do. Uh, but the advantage is that we know, know the image of this uh, these points here. So yeah, this, this we do not know. Um, because we compute this isogeny ourselves. So this one goes to zero, so we quotient it out. And this one goes to psi of p uh, two prime. Right, so we compute psi ourselves, we know the image. But note that, um, so now note, that if you look at psi composed with phi of p1, well, that's phi of p1, and then you apply psi, so that takes us to zero. And um, psi composed with phi of uh, p2, well, phi of p2 is this, but then psi annihilates p1, okay? So it eats this, and so this will also be psi of p2 prime. And so uh, now we have this bigger isogeny, uh, and we know how it acts on a basis of the n-torsion. And moreover, this bigger isogeny has degree uh, n times d, which is um, yeah, and and uh, and this is smaller than. The amount of uh, and the interpolating group because the interpolating group is of size. Uh, yeah, so let me. So this thing here is bigger than uh, four times that degree because uh, n was bigger than four times d. So you just multiply both sides here by n and you get this. Okay, so we have uh, from our interpolation problem. We have, have obtained a new interpolation problem, but where we know how the isogeny acts on the full n torsion. So we have reduced to case one, and I hope that you see that uh, this condition is uh, very strongly violated uh, here. Yeah, so the isogeny uh, psi composed with phi has degree n times d. Okay, so the GCD here will be n instead of one. Uh, and so you need this generalization uh, in order to proceed. Um, but yeah, by lack of time, so there are, these ingredients here are not super surprising, but uh, it's a bit more technical. Uh, but this is uh, kind of the main reduction. Um, okay, so uh, I think I'm running out of time, so I would like to stop here. <laughs>